Well, good morning and um, uh, welcome to Terra Firma's latest professional practice webinar. Uh, this is part of the Terra Firma uh, Chamber's 2020 vision series uh, and on this occasion particularly focuses on bringing clarity to professional practice in these obviously recent challenging times. Uh, as you may be aware, this is part of a series that Terra Firma has been doing over the last uh, few weeks and months. Uh, and we've covered so far topics on local government, insolvency, the lasting effects of EU law in, in the UK, uh, employment law and planning law. So in addressing professional practice today, this is the seventh in our series. And I should just let everyone know that um, we plan to have one more uh, a Terra Firma uh, event in this series this month on the topic of private clients uh, and, uh, and thereafter we hope to pick up again uh, after August into September. So I'm delighted to say that this morning we have in addition to myself three speakers. Uh, firstly we're going to hear from Ewan Brown uh, on client confidentiality and lockdown, the threats and challenges and then continuing that confidentiality theme, uh, we're going to hear from Andy Bowen QC on confidentiality and privilege, a difficult subject. And then well warned on these issues of confidentiality, uh, John Kiddy Advocate, uh, one of our new Terra Firma members, and myself, we are going to split the subject of remote hearings, law procedure and practice. And John's going to set out a lot of the regulatory frame, frameworks around uh, remote hearings and recent case law. And I may just tell a few war stories. Um, so with that in mind, can I just remind everyone also that there's a Q&A function. Uh, if, you, if you hover your mouse on your, your screen, Zoom allows you to see along the foot of the page uh, various uh, items. I can see at the moment there's 43 participants, so that's great to see. Um, and along in the right there, you'll see a Q&A function. Please, please make good use of this. Any, any points that, that you think of interest or something you want to raise, just um, uh, uh, text, in, uh, text the, uh, the, the question uh, using that function. We can pick it up. Uh, very happy to answer questions as we go uh, or deal with them at, at the end. So, uh, with, with all of that uh, by way of introduction, can I just then hand over to, to Ewan and uh, uh, Ewan, can you, can you give us your presentation on client confidentiality? Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Well, good morning. Uh, given the synergy of, uh, between my talk and uh, the talk which Andy is about to uh, deliver, I thought I would start with a quote, and it's a quote from Patterson and Ritchie, um, Law, Practice and Conduct for Solicitors. Uh, as you know, that is the key work in Scotland about the standards which are expected from uh, solicitors today. They say that undoubtedly the issue of confidentiality is one of the most important topics in professional relationships uh, today. They go on to comment that the obligation is so significant in relation to solicitors that it is recognised around the world to varying uh, degrees. Now, when considering the topic of uh, the duty of confidentiality which is owed by a solicitor, it has to be remembered that the obligation arises in a different variety of ways. Uh, and, and it should also be remembered that those ways coexist. First of all, there is the professional duty, which is probably the one which is most readily thought of, uh, and that is expressed in Rule B1 of the Standards of Conduct, promulgated by the Law Society of Scotland. Uh, and it's succinctly stated as, you must maintain client confidentiality. The duty also uh, arises uh, under the law of evidence. There is the solicitor client uh, privilege, uh, and Andy will say more uh, about that. It arises under the law of agency. It's part of the fiduciary duty, which is owed by a principal, sorry, owed by an agent to their principal, 
transacting good faith and in a way which safeguards the interests of uh, the principal. And obviously any breach of confidentiality may prejudice that. It arises as a contractual obligation uh, in the solicitor client engagement. The obligation may be express or it may be uh, implied. Uh, and given that it's recognized that confidentiality is a fundamental aspect of the relationship, even if it's not expressly uh, applied, it must by implication uh, arise. It can arise th the, through the law of delict. Uh, and finally, as we all know, data protection has added another layer of safeguard for uh, clients. Now, I, I mentioned that the obligation arises in a different variety of contexts. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we probably don't stop and think of all the different ways in which the obligation uh, arises. But the ways in which they come about and the variety of ways in which they are bro um, is brought about comes home when the consequences of a breach uh, are considered. First of all, there's the threat to the client relationship. Uh, Secondly, there is the prospect of a complaint uh, on the basis that the fundamental duty has been breached. Uh, and of course, that could give rise to a finding of inadequate professional services or unsatisfactory professional conduct or even professional misconduct. Unsatisfactory professional conduct and professional misconduct are, of course, sanctions against the practitioner rather than against the firm. Uh, and hopefully, um, except in cases uh, which are very extreme, if there's been a breach of confidentiality, which gives rise to a complaint, it will result in a finding of inadequate professional uh, services. But obviously, it's not possible to rule out the prospect of a finding of unsatisfactory professional conduct or professional misconduct. The Scott. The SLCC can also make an award of compensation. Uh, generally, those awards are for distress and inconvenience. Uh, and the SLCC reports that the common award for such distress and inconvenience is in the range of 150 to 500 pounds. But the limit is up to 5,000 pounds. The SLCC has power to award additional compensation, but of course it requires proof of actual loss. Uh, but overall, it has to be remembered the SLCC has the power to impose a maximum award of £20,000. Uh, there could also be damages for breach of contract um, on the basis that the obligation of confidentiality uh, has been breached and obviously there is the potential there for much higher awards than the ceiling on the award which the SLCC uh, can award. And finally, there's the potential for a fine under the general data protection uh, regulations. Uh, it's well known, I think, that the maximum fine is up to 20 million euros or 4% of turnover, whichever is larger. So it's pretty staggering and pretty worrying. Um, if the breach results in a GDPR breach uh, as well. And, and as I say, these uh, remedies which are available to the client uh, coexist. Turning though to the topic of the threats uh, and challenges to um, client confidentiality caused as a result of lockdown. Although the concept of confidentiality is ingrained into the DNA, uh, of solicitors, in my experience, is an, uh, an area which uh, can easily lead to uh, breaches occurring. Uh, I was previously a risk management partner for my firm and I dealt with issues which arose both within the firm from time to time and also issues caused by other firms sending um, communications which were not intended uh, for the firm. I, I met others at conferences on risk management uh, and it was always a perennial topic uh, for discussions. Uh, and in those discussions, what struck me was it was rare to find a deliberate breach. Solicitors were acutely conscious of the obligation, but where a breach occurred, it had more come about through inadvertence. 
Of course, traditionally, the issue tended to arise where wrong enclosures were put in envelopes, letters were wrongly addressed, uh, or faxes had been sent to the wrong uh, recipient. But of course, methods of communication uh, moved on to being electronic, uh, and in lockdown, we're even more reliant upon uh, electronic communications than before. And of course, emails have brought their own hazards. Uh, first of all, there's been a proliferation of communication. People are now regularly contact, uh, copied in to communications which they wouldn't have been uh, years ago. Uh, and of course, email addresses, just like postal addresses, can be wrongly entered. Uh, and a particular hazard of email is the autofilling of names uh, in the two box. I know I've received emails which I should not have received, and I'm quite sure that everyone here today uh, will be in the same uh, position. Most emails um, have somewhere uh, on it, usually in the footer, wording to the effect that the email was intended for the uh, particular recipient to whom it was addressed. And there's usually some wording that the contents are confidential uh, somewhere uh, in that footer. But of course, that wording is designed to limit the consequences of the breach. It doesn't absolve the sender from the fact a breach uh, has taken place. Uh, another hazard is attachments to emails. Are they correct? Um, strings of emails, uh, that's another significant uh, hazard. First of all, is it appropriate that everyone is copied in uh, on the email? And uh, in a very long string of emails, can it be remembered what was actually said at the start of the email string? And is it appropriate that everyone who's now receiving the email is aware of what was said at the start. Uh, I remember hearing uh, of a case where the email string started with an early email from the client to the solicitor providing details of the client's bank account. And somehow, I don't know how this happened, but somehow as the string grew and grew and grew, the solicitor on the other side um, became copied in in the email. Uh, and of course, they just happened to scroll right down to the very bottom of the string uh, to realise that they had their client's opponent's bank account uh, details, which they then used to serve an arrestment. I don't know how that ever resolved, but it was a very stark example of how you really have to think about who's been copied in uh, on uh, emails. Uh, information storage is a particular issue particularly in lockdown. When we worked on hard copy files, we all, I'm sure, took them home and we looked after them uh, well. But uh, if the file got lost or something on the file got lost, at least it was just one piece of information relating to one transaction for one uh, client. Uh, and then, of course, the file would be returned um, to the office just as soon as we'd finished with it. But uh, with um, the introduction of electronic resources, we now have the situation where uh, a lot more information is available uh, on client business, on mobile devices such as laptops, handhelds, iPads, uh, and the like. So that also presents a risk. When it comes to actually storing the information, if it's in hard, uh, copy, and I appreciate that that's less common now, but I am aware from speaking to agents working from home that they do still have hard copy materials at home. There is an emerging school of thought in the context of how to mitigate the potential for a fine by the Information Commissioner's Office in the event of a GT GDPR breach, that when hard copy papers are not being worked on, they should be kept in a locked non-portable container. And ideally, there should be some physical security measures in place, such as an alarm or a lock on the room in which the files are stored. With electronic devices, if your firm has issued you with a laptop or an iPad or a mobile phone for use in connection with business, is it locked away when it's not being used just as 
hard copy papers are expected to be uh, locked away. There's also the issue of uh, the destruction of uh, papers. Uh, if you were working with papers in the office and you were finished with them, it would no doubt be second nature to you to just put the redundant papers in the confidential waste bin. But how, you, how are you dealing with that if you're finishing with papers at home? Are you saving them up to take them into the office to put them into the confidential shredding bin? in which case they should be stored like any other hard copy papers, i.e. securely in a non-portable locked cabinet. Or are you uh, shredding them uh, as you go? It's also important to think about your workplace place, um, at home. Do others have access to it? I don't mean just members of your family, but is there anyone else who might be able to view uh, what you're working on? Is there a risk of noise breakout when you're on the, the telephone or on video conference calls and so on? Uh, and are there any hazards uh, round about? Uh, I could tell a very long uh, story, but I'll keep it short. But uh, I did have a, a colleague who uh, didn't realise for a couple of hours that as a result of working near an open window, a couple of papers from the top of their filing basket had blown out uh, of the window and ended up uh, in the garden outside the office building. Uh, thankfully, they were all retrieved without any harm being done, but it was an example of how things uh, can happen without you realising. There's also the issue of knowing how to react quickly to uh, a breach, or a potential breach, at least. Uh, if your laptop or phone was lost, do you know who to contact urgently within your organisation to kill the device and potentially stop the spread uh, of information? Do you know who that person is and do you have a contact number uh, for them? Th these details should be kept somewhere where they're readily accessible and obviously not on the device itself. Uh, remember also that any uh, breach of client confidentiality these days also has the potential to be a data protection breach. There is an obligation to notify certain breaches uh, to the Information Commissioner's Office and uh, you have 72 hours in which to do that. So it's important to react quickly to that uh, as well. And if it's thought that a, a referral has to be made to the Inf Information Commissioner's Office, you also have to notify uh, your client uh, of the breach. Uh, and then finally, um, always expect the unexpected it's important to keep your working practices under review um, just to make sure there are no risks which uh, are emerging. It's commonly said that much as we can manage risk and we should manage risk, unfortunately, we cannot eliminate it uh, altogether. So uh, with that cheery thought, uh, I'll now hand over to uh, Andy uh, for his part of the talk. Thank you very much, Ewan. Uh, I found that very, uh, very thorough and, uh, and very chilling, so a, a very useful talk. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you mentioned, I'm going to look in a little bit more detail into confidentiality and privilege. Again, as, as Ewan said, we want to have a very clear understanding of confidentiality or privilege as that privilege which attaches to our communications with our clients in relation to the legal advice that we provide to them, and which means that those communications are not to be disclosed unless either the client gives permission or that privilege is otherwise waived. What makes privilege a difficult subject, I think, is how that broad definition is then applied to what will inevitably be grey areas, whether in respect of the type of advice we're, being, we're giving, or who is the recipient of that advice. So if I can look at the first slide, please. This slide just really sets out uh, the way that privilege is generally categorized. So under the, the heading of legal professional privilege, we under, would understand that a right of absolute privilege in communications between a lawyer and the client 
relating to advice attracts legal advice privilege or LAP, but also that in respect of any documents which are being prepared in contemplation of litigation, litigation privilege or LP, and that will also extend to documents which are in the hands of third parties. In other words, not the, neither the client or the lawyer, but others who are involved in preparing that documentation. So we have LPP, LAP, and LP. If I can go on to the second slide, please. The sort of advice that, that we as external lawyers will give directly to clients on specifically legal matters are unlikely to give rise to, to any difficulties. We would know that that is definitely covered by the legal advice privilege. Where difficulties can arise will result from the, the complexity of arrangements now for commercial transactions and the obtaining of legal advice, particularly including uh, the new mode of communication, which again you referred to, particularly uh, use of emails and copying and blind copying. As a result, legal advice itself may be provided by either external or in-house lawyers on a wide range of commercial matters, which may include um, legal and just general business advice, to a wide range of recipients, so that as a result, it can often be more difficult to decide which sort of advice has that privilege attaching to it. One of the tests which the court has adopted is, is that of what they refer to legal spectacles. So legal advice privilege may apply if a lawyer is being asked to apply his legal skills and look at legal questions through legal spectacles, including advising what should be done prudently and sensibly in a legal context. The test of prudently and sensibly advising a legal context comes from the House of Law decision in the Three Rivers case, where Advice has been provided by external lawyers on how the Bank of England could best present its case before the BCCI inquiry. The, the bank had argued that there, that uh, documentation in relation to that advice was privileged. The Court of Appeal, however, said that that advice was not sufficiently legal to attract privilege. Um, but the House of Lords then applied this broader approach of advising what should be done prudently and sensibly in a legal context to find privilege did attach to that communi those communications. So in other words, for legal advice privilege to apply, it's not necessary that the communication is telling the client what the law is or advising on a legal principle, providing there is a, a legal context. However, it's still necessary to identify how the document itself discloses the communication of advice and a useful illustration provided by a first instance decision a versus B, the Financial Reporting Council Limited, when the, the company, the Financial Reporting Council Limited, argued that privilege attached to certain board minutes, which reflected advice given by external lawyers, that was their argument. However, the court said that wasn't enough. And what it did was it closely scrutinized uh, the minutes and previous draft of the minutes, including examining the metadata, which would have shown who had had input into the draft in the minutes to see, to see exactly what it was that the external lawyers had been doing. And in that case, the court found in relation to a number of drafts and the minutes, that they were simply a record of the meeting and which had recorded neither expressly given legal advice or indeed even reflected the legal advice which had been given. In other words, simply stating that lawyers have had an input into it would not be enough. If I can move on to the, the third and last slide, please. Now, as, as the test uh, is that the confidential communication between the lawyer and client must be for the purpose of giving or obtaining legal advice, that must be the dominant purpose of the communication, especially if the communication also dealt with non-legal commercial issues. Now, that, that's easier said than done. Um, a useful illustration of uh, the way that the court will approach that particular uh, dichotomy is provided in the JET 2.com case, where 
object to challenge in judicial, judicial review proceedings the publication by the, the Civil Aviation Authority of a letter criticizing JET 2 for refusing to join uh, an ADR scheme to mediate passenger claims against airlines. JET 2 applied for disclosure of drafts of the letter, in other words, to try and find out what the motivation behind it was. And the, the Civil Aviation Authority said that these were privileged because in house legal advisors had been involved in discussions and gave advice. Well, Justice Hickey Bottom, uh, who gave the main judgment, uh, set out a number of propositions which are, are useful just to, to flesh out. He said that, that, that legal advice privilege applies to communication not only with lawyers in private practice, but also with in-house lawyers. That privilege covers not only documents from the lawyer containing advice and the client's own written record of advice, but also any communication passing on, considering or applying the advice internally, or even disseminating that advice to third parties, and communication from a lawyer to a third party containing information provided by the lawyer to the lawyer or the client covered by the legal advice privilege. However, the privilege applies to communication only for the purpose of obtaining or giving legal advice and not professional or commercial advice. And the material collected by a client or lawyer on his behalf from a third party used to instruct lawyers will not itself be attract the privilege. Then for, for the privilege, the legal advice privilege to apply to a particular communication, its dominant purpose must have been to obtain legal advice. In other words, the, the dominant purpose is to seek legal advice or the email attachment must might realistically disclose an issue of the advice being sought from or given by the in-house lawyer. Um, there wasn't any dispute in, in that case that the advice provided by the in-house lawyer was covered by the privilege. The issue related to multi-address emails, in other words, where um, these emails were received by parties who were not themselves legally qualified or lawyers. And the, the decision of court appeal was simply that um, in those circumstances, each email had to be considered as a, a separate communication between the sender and each recipient. So it might be worth, as uh, even as, as mentioned, often you can have a, a, a long string of emails dealing with uh, a variety of matters. It might also be worth bearing in mind um, that mixing legal and non-legal advice to clients within the same communication may complicate matters in relation to disclosure. And so it may be appropriate just to think about dividing out how that advice is provided so that there is clarity that the, the legal advice, the legal communication itself be, uh, will be covered by the privilege. So that, that's what I want to say on, on privilege. Um, and it's now my pleasure to hand over to John to deal with um, his remote experience. Thanks very much for that introduction, uh, Andy. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is John Kiddy. For my part of this presentation, and before I hand over to Stephen, I'm going to focus on current rules for remote hearings during lockdown, as well as some of the orders, guidance, and practice notes issued by our courts. I myself actually only called as an advocate earlier this year, and I called during lockdown, which I have to say did feel rather strange. Even the calling ceremony itself was conducted in line with social distancing. As for the training programme, this included elements of classroom tuition and practical exercises. And in March of this year, these were actually switched over to Zoom. Uh, therefore, my fellow Divils and I actually got some real hands-on experience of remote business uh, as part of our training and before we called. Uh, for example, one of the practical exercises was a simulation of cross-examining a vulnerable witness by live TV link. And in view of uh, subsequent judicial comments in favour of remote hearings, uh, as has been the experience during lockdown, it's quite conceivable that they may continue to play a, a greater role in litigation even after the uh, disappearance of the coronavirus. Therefore, for me, I feel that learning how to take part in them uh, has, has been a very valuable experience. Before I move on to look at uh, some of the rules in a bit more detail, can I just uh, remind delegates that they are 
free to use the the Q&A uh, function uh, of the, uh, the the Zoom software if you want to flag up a question uh, while we're speaking and uh, we'll might be able to have some discussion on at the end. If I could move on now, please, to the next uh, slide. So therefore, in terms of the uh, legislative and a regulatory response to coronavirus, generally speaking, the amount of uh, legislation produced by the UK Parliament and devolved assemblies has been, well, frankly, staggering. Uh, and the, the amount of subordinate regulations produced by the various national governments has been even more massive. However, concentrating on Scottish remote hearings for court and tribunal purposes, the principal relevant legislative provisions uh, can be found in the first Coronavirus Scotland Act 2020. That's the, the number one act, and particularly in part one of Schedule 4. This part of the Act uh, bears the headline Courts and Tribunals Conduct of Business by Electronic Means. Essentially, what the, the Act says is that hearings are to be conducted otherwise than by requiring persons physically to attend court or tribunal. In other words, they are to be conducted remotely unless the court or tribunal specifically orders physical attendance. And this is the what I like to think of as the, the primary default, and it applies to all hearings except for trials, where the opposite default applies. In other words, in the case of trials, persons must attend physically unless the court or tribunal uh, specifically orders uh, remote hearing. Now, this part of the Act uses the words trial. It doesn't refer to criminal or civil, but it does use the words trial. And I take this to encompass the mainstay of criminal litigation. Therefore, the Act, in effect, sets up one default for most civil business and the opposite default for criminal business. However, for both civil and criminal cases, the test for deviating from the default is the same which is uh, prejudice to the fairness of proceedings or otherwise contrary to justice. And it's important not to forget about that test or to overlook it and to remember that you can address the court on its exercise of the test. In other words, you may feel that a remote hearing is not suitable for a particular case, or for a particular client, or for a particular witness. And you can discuss this with the judge in advance. Paragraph two of part one uses the term requirement that a person physically attend court. Therefore, it is the requirement that attendance be physical that is dispensed with, not the requirement to attend court. This way, the requirement becomes one of remote attendance, and this is reinforced by paragraph three, which requires remote attendance by electronic means, and also makes failure to attend a remote hearing during lockdown punishable, just as failure to attend an actual courthouse would be punishable in normal times. The that is, it's a temporary measure. It contains a sunset clause, thus is due to expire on 30th of September. However, it's perhaps likely that we may see this date extended. And as I said initially, uh, remote procedure may continue to play a, a greater role in litigation even after COVID. Can I have the next slide, please? So moving on to look at uh, some of the, uh, the detail of the response by our courts, just as government has been very busy over the last few months, our courts have also been uh, extremely productive in responding to the pandemic. For months now, Scotland's three national courts, our six sheriffdoms and 16 hub sheriff courts have been issuing and updating orders, guidance and practice notes. 
the amount of information can feel overwhelming. Fortunately, all of it can be found on the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service website. For example, on this slide, uh, we can see, unfortunately, not very uh, clearly because it's, it's so detailed, uh, but you, you can find it on the, uh, the, the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service website. What this slide is, is uh, a, a table summarising the, the situation for civil business across our courts. And it refers to a mix of technology currently in use, including remote video hearings, telephone conferencing and written submissions. It also refers to some indicators of priority of business. For example, the All Scotland Sheriff Personal Injury Court is processing writs to avoid time limit, while at the same time asking practitioners not to submit writs for the time limit lies further ahead, and I think it specifies six months. Also, the Sheriff Courts are focusing on urgent matters, for example, uh, child care orders, interim interdicts, and urgent corporate insolvency applications. Meanwhile, the hub Sheriff Courts have been set up to help filter and channel business. However, it's extremely important to bear in mind that these arrangements are subject to modification. Therefore, it's important to check regularly uh, for updates on the, uh, the Scottish Court Service website. Can I have the next slide, please? That's the uh, link for the, uh, the, the, the website, and uh, helpfully, it contains a, a section specifically dedicated to the latest updates. So there, for example, we find the latest update for uh, the Court of Session, which is dated 22nd June. And in that, we can see that the, the inner house is sitting as a, a virtual court. In other words, it's using uh, remote uh, video hearings, whereas the outer house is conducting procedural hearings by telephone and reserving WebEx for substantive hearings although suitability is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. For both courts, documents are to be submitted electronically in accordance with the Act. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Although obviously our main interest is Scotland, it's also useful to look at what's going on south of the border. There, the Judicial College has published interesting and useful guidance for judges in respect of factors to take into account for remote hearings. The guidance relates to conduct of remote hearings and also deals with factors that judges should consider when deciding whether or not to fix a remote hearing at all. And also the, the recent Court of Appeal judgment in the case of Ray A, Children Remote Hearing Care and Placement Orders, provides further commentary on this. In that case, the Court of Appeal overturned a judge's decision to fix a, a hybrid hearing subject to certain stipulations. And although the, uh, the original case related to children's hearings, the Court of Appeal has made a number of findings of general application to all types of remote hearing. To summarise, for me, the essentials are one, the decision on the form of hearing should be decided on a case by case basis. Two, the judge at first instance has broad discretion in this. Three, the judge should refer to guidance, but guidance is only guidance. And this guidance is only temporary, while the prevailing circumstances themselves may continue to change from day to day. Four, like the Judicial College, uh, the, the Court of Appeal also discusses factors to be taken into account when deciding whether to fix a remote hearing at all. And these include, for example, parties' access to technology, because not everyone has uh, ready availability uh, for computers and, and internet. Uh, also, domestic circumstances and personal circumstances. And finally, uh, the, the case discusses factors uh, underpinning the uh, the decision maker's choice in form of hearing and refers to uh, parties having a fair hearing 
and crucially also that justice be seen to be done, uh, even by remote hearing. Much of the Court of Appeals judgment is transferable to the test contained in the Scottish legislation that I've already mentioned, which is, uh, to remind everyone, prejudice to the fairness of proceedings and otherwise contrary to justice. Can I move on to the next slide, please? Very briefly, before I hand over to Stephen, uh, and turning back just briefly to my own experience, as said, the, the Faculty of Advocates training programme for new advocates included a simulation of cross-examining a vulnerable witness by live TV link. The Devils undertook that exercise during lockdown. However, it was actually devised before lockdown, before anyone knew about the pandemic. And this perhaps serves as a reminder that uh, although remote hearings have suddenly become extremely important for most litigators, they are not entirely new. For example, provision has existed for taking evidence by a live TV link since 1990, uh, and the Employment Tribunal rules have permitted the conduct of hearings by electronic means since long before these days of COVID. On this slide, I've outlined a, a potted history of the evolution of law and technology as relevant to remote hearings as I see it in a, a much more general sense. However, in any event, the basic message is, whereas in the past, remote hearings were perhaps a rather niche form of practice, nowadays many more practitioners do need to embrace them, at least for the time being, and perhaps indeed for a lot longer than that. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I now want to hand over to Stephen O'Rourke, QC. Thank you. John, uh, thank you very much um, for for that for setting out so clearly um, for everyone uh, the the law procedure and practice um, framework uh, around remote hearings, and and likewise thanks to you and, and Andy for for their talks on on confidentiality, uh, which as I said at the outset I think are a good lead in um, to the whole discussion around remote hearings, and. Um, just before I say anything else, can I just remind everyone who's uh, who, who's attending? I think we're just up over fifty participants, which is great to see. Um, there is a Q and A function. Please feel free to ask any questions or make any contributions that occur to you. They're very welcome. Um, particularly as I'm about to embark, I think now on on what I hope might might be a, a, something that might generate a bit of discussion or thought because I'd, I'd really like to try and discuss against the background of uh, the remote hearings framework that John has set out, a little of my own personal experience um, over these last few weeks and months. I'm sure we've all found this an extraordinary time, uh, unprecedented uh, in the way that it's impacted uh, our, our practice as lawyers. Um, but as, as it was a good reminder there from John just at the end of his talk that there's, there's really nothing new under the sun. And, and while we've had to move to this new way of doing things, uh, particularly using uh, screen technology and, and using our telephones perhaps much more than we've ever used them before, uh, it, it does just bring to the fore again th things that have been uh, focused on uh, before. And, as, as you'll have seen from the very um, uh, simple slide that I've, I've set out, and Ewan, if you could just go to that, the very first thing I wanted to mention was written advocacy. Uh, because as John has indicated, the, the constraints in a way of the, of, of the system, it seems to me, in my experience, uh, really brings to bear again the necessity for clear, crisp, well-focused, um, uh, written materials, whether that's pleadings, uh, summonses, defences, petitions and answers, or notes of argument that follow thereon. And whilst we've not been in court, of course, to quite the same extent or quite the same way, uh, I have certainly found that it's very helpful and useful to, to put as much effort as possible into the written advocacy. Uh, in order to get the message across to the court uh, to get to set out the arguments uh, as well as possible. So that's, that's just, again, a very, very broad general uh, reminder about that issue. The second 
really big point, I think, <laughs> that we've all experienced. And certainly, um, again, I find myself having to make pretty, pretty big leaps um, away from the, the ring binders that we're also used to, to paperless technology. And as I sit here now, of course, I've got my iPad to one side uh, with, with the slides and other materials available. And, and my computer is, is really just the portal by which I'm able to, to speak to you or, or um, if it was a court hearing, um, uh, address the court uh, or indeed ask questions of a witness. So that move away from, from, from paper, embracing paperless technology has obviously been a massive feature. And on the whole, I think it's fair to say that it's, it's, been, it's, it's been a very uh, useful um, exercise. I find it very helpful. I've, I'm certainly a lot more adept at using programs like Adobe software and bookmarking um, and, and preparing documents in a way that, that, that they can then be used by everybody at the same time and accessed by everyone at the same time using a, a, a neutral internal numbering system so that the judge has that, parties have that, and if there is a witness, that the witness can have that too. Um, again, as John uh, did well to remind us, however, of course, the whole system generally only works at the pace of the, of the party who has the greatest limitation in these resources. And of course, there are many of us uh, who, who our firms are very well set up, or as practitioners, we're, we're very well advanced and we're keen to, to really move ahead. But, but others are maybe more limited in this regard. Interestingly, I think one, the, the, the kind of key party who has often been the most limited is the court itself. And I dare say that many of us have had the experience in recent weeks where we're trying to lodge uh, virtual materials or documents and, 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 and the court is bouncing things or, or saying that they have to be resubmitted. I, I mean, one, one obvious thing that comes up is um, the size of file. That, that many clerks are prepared to accept or that they can accept using the court of session system. Um, that attachments can only, be, can only have a certain um, memory size. Uh, but obviously you just have a dialogue with the, with the clerks about that and one way or another it's often possible to, to manage it such that the judge is able then to get um, the paperless materials. Uh, but as I say, again, just a very big general point, the move to paperless technology. Uh, and as I say already, that, that very important focus on written advocacy. Which then leads me on just to the third point. As I say, this is more just my own reflections on, on, on recent experience. Your own experiences, I'm sure, are, are many and varied. And, and it may be that you know, I, I've had much less experience than, than many of you. I can only speak to, to what my experience has been. Um, as we know, as many of you will, will know, that uh, the Court of Session has been using a system called WebEx, uh, which I think is run by a company, Cisco Systems, an American company. It's a very similar system to uh, Zoom in many regards. Uh, you, there are participants can be in the room uh, observing, so the, the, the parties to the, the proceedings themselves uh, can uh, attend the hearing, journalists can attend the hearing, and the parties and the judge obviously are uh, the, the, the main participants. It was initially used in the, in the inner house, and that was the first um, encounter I had with it in a, a, a property uh, case, which uh, was was dealt with at a, a reclaiming motion at the end of April, and uh, counsel were able to address the uh, the court uh, with the judges uh, attending remotely uh, from their chambers. And what was very useful in in that, and again, this may be an experience of some, uh, was that using a WhatsApp system, uh, it was possible for counsel, myself and, and, and junior counsel, to, to be in communication with agents and then a separate WhatsApp group between agents and the client. I actually found that that worked very well in the hearing 
uh, and and the kind of points in time that we're all familiar with from court hearings where you, know, you turn around and check a point um, uh, with your instructing solicitor or uh, you as the instructing solicitor would be keen to remind counsel of some of some important bit of information using WhatsApp you, it was possible to do that very quickly and very effectively and and with everyone using uh, a neutrally numbered document with all of the productions and authorities in it to be able then just to take the court quickly to that um, so that was my first encounter with Webex in, in the inner house. Uh, I, I was involved in a number of outer house uh, hearings just using uh, procedural hearings as John has indicated uh, using, using uh, t the telephone, uh, essentially having a kind of conference call of the kind I think which had been used already for some years in the, in the commercial courts in Glasgow Sheriff Court and Edinburgh Sheriff Court. Um, in addition to, to those kind of procedural hearings, however, a couple of weeks ago I had a, a two-day judicial review hearing uh, which, which ran using Webex in the outer house in front of Lord Fairley. And it was, a, as I say, it was a two-day hearing starting at, uh, at 10 o'clock. Uh, and on the first day we finished at five o'clock. Uh, on the second day we, we sat from 11 uh, a.m. Until, until 4 p.m. Um, I must say I found the process exhausting uh, because you're you're very very focused intently on the on the screen all of the time and uh, we did have one or two breaks I, I wouldn't say we necessarily had terribly many more breaks than we might normally have in court proceedings um, which is worth reflecting on because I think I think the inner house actually has they've had a policy uh, thinking back that no more than about 90 minutes I think continuously of a, of a hearing without a break because it does appear to be a well recognized uh, phenomenon that that hearings in this format are are pretty exhausting um, so again though I would have to say that once we got through we, we pushed through a lot of the teething issues around um, the lodging of, of documents and and being able to get uh, the judge up and running with uh, a full a full bundle of, of virtual documents. Uh, once we once we got through those issues, uh, I would have to say the hearing proceeded very well. Um, both my experiences in the inner house and in the outer house, of course, have not involved witnesses. Similarly, um, I've been involved planning inquiries. Um, with a couple of procedural hearings and, and, and planning inquiries. Uh, the reporters have been using Zoom and that seems to, to work very well, much in, in the way that we can see it operating right now. Uh, the, the only hearings I've been involved in uh, virtually that have, that have involved witnesses uh, have actually been parole board hearings, which, which I've been chairing. Um, I think mental health tribunal hearings have been following a similar pattern. Um, and these have been proceeding using the, t the telephone alone. And th this, this can be very challenging uh, with as many as 10 people in a hearing and essentially uh, talking to, to one's telephone. Uh, and, and in the course of, of these hearings, uh, witnesses giving evidence in answer to questions. But if everybody just simply observes appropriate um, uh, timing and uh, and and giving appropriate indications as to when one person is finishing and the next person is picking up. Uh, the, those hearings uh, I found also were able to work very effectively. Um, the one downside in all of this, of course, and I particularly want to just talk about, about uh, proceedings where evidence is taken. Uh, we have, of course, and as John was indicating there, the, 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 the devil's training has, has tried to focus more um, and, and no doubt will focus a great deal more on, on the taking of evidence remotely. And this is something that has been part of our system, of course, for a number of years, both in the, in the criminal sphere. Uh, vulnerable witnesses often um, give evidence um, from elsewhere in the building uh, using CCTV. And it has its uses, of course, in certain sensitive civil proceedings. Uh, 
So it is not a technique that we're, we're not used to. Uh, some people have expressed, I think quite rightly, disquiet about routinely taking evidence uh, using, using a kind of remote hearing uh, arrangement. And the case that John referred to is a very, a very useful case uh, in Ray uh, A, the, the Court of Appeal case from England, gives some excellent general guidance about that. And as we know, the courts in England have been very quick to use um, and, and move to virtual hearings in a lot of circumstances. Uh, although I think also, as John reminded us, it's fair to say that that has created some uh, response along the lines of, well, it might be okay for the lawyers in the court to charge ahead, but but the participants themselves don't always find it um, an entirely just uh, a process. So that's that's obviously very important to bear that in mind. Uh, so I really, you know, I think that's there's a number of other points that that one could mention. Uh, I mean, uh, another another obvious issue that arises. Um, with the taking of evidence remotely is when witnesses are in a remote location that can raise issues about the security of, 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 of the witnesses' circumstances and how the court can uh, uh, control that, so to speak. Um, but in broad terms, as I say, I think although it, is, it has been taking some time for, for Scotland's courts uh, on the civil side to to become used to uh, working in a in a remote environment and and these have obviously been very significant changes. My own general experience and uh, sense of sense of it has that once once the procedures uh, have started to 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 work um, and become a little more routine, they have on the whole worked worked very well. And of course, there are uh, certain urgent matters or emergency matters, particularly in, in family law and that kind of thing, uh, where, where hearings do have to take place urgently. I'm also conscious that one of my colleagues recently um, in, had a hearing proceed in, in, in Parliament House uh, where there were disability issue, live disability issues, and the Lord President decided that really the, the best answer was a, a proper hearing, so to speak, in court one, uh, where where the Lord President, uh, sorry, it was actually Lord Woolman, uh, dealt with matters uh, at a procedural hearing. Uh, that was a, a hearing for leave to appeal um, from the upper tribunal uh, to the inner house. So, it, so it was a it was a leave to appeal hearing that progressed just a week or two ago. Uh, so there are some circumstances where hearings are progressing. I'm pleased to say that I've been in the Advocates Library um, a reasonable amount in the last week or two. Um, things are getting slightly back to normal in, 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 in the sense that people, civil practitioners are back reasonably regularly using the library, the resources there. Uh, all of the appropriate um, measures have been put in place um, uh, in order to make sure that the library is a, um, is a safe place um, for everyone to work. But that's been very encouraging too, uh, in order to see uh, the courts and and the faculty uh, back up and running in, in, in that way. So there's much to be there's much to be optimistic about. I think the, the challenges that we've been facing are are very significant, but it really just fo it focuses all our attention. I think again on you know what are our core skills, how do we improve things to to do things more effectively using the available technology. And how do we continue to offer you know, a very high quality of service to, to those who need access to Scotland's courts? And of course, that, that won't change. So um, that's really all I had to, to say. Uh, I see that that's almost exactly 12 o'clock. Um, so we've been, we've been going for about an hour. Um, if there are any questions, uh, that's great. Uh, if there's not any questions, that's equally great. We can have an early bath. Uh, but please bear in mind, if there's anything you want to ask or follow up on hereafter, uh, you're perfectly welcome to do so. And our clerk, Emma, will be very happy to forward all of the slides, I think, um, to, f for you all to be able to, to use uh, and consider 
if, if that's useful hereafter. And just one final reminder that, of course, there will be another Terra Firma 2020 Vision uh, seminar later this month uh, on, on private client issues. So thank you very much for attending and uh, we hope you thank find you. a useful experience. Stephen, before you... Yeah. Just picking up on um, your comment about uh, dealing with evidence, there may come a point where it's simply too complex to deal with remotely. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm due to have a, an international commercial arbitration here in, at the end of this month in London. Um, and the arbitrator, Sylvana Ricks, uh, simply decided that the technical difficulties involved with witnesses in different countries, and I was smiling when you used to work with witnesses, is stuck on Sakhalin Island uh, off the east coast of Russia, uh, where there's no guarantee that there'd be any sort of uh, internet access for him for, for six months. So I think you're quite right to point out that uh, technical part that sometimes is simply going to be too difficult to, to arrange. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, absolutely. Uh, there, there, there are clear limitations to to, um, to 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 what can be achieved using using remote technology. But um, sorry, did any of our other panelists have any points to make? John, was yeah. there, you think there's something to say, John? I don't, I don't think there's there have been any questions so far. But someone has made an observation regarding uh, the uh, the table that I produced from the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service website actually uh, having been superseded by a more up-to-date version uh, so thank you very much for that and i think that that simply underlines my, my basic message which is that uh these arrangements are changing so swiftly that you really do do need to uh check up on them you, you need to be up to date with them uh and and pre-preparation is even more important with these types of hearing than uh, ever before in terms of, of checking what the arrangements are and um, just planning ahead. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for, for those contributions and, um, and thanks to everyone on our panel again today. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll just draw the, draw the proceedings to a close, I think. Um, and we look forward to, to seeing you at, um, uh, at future Terra Firma events. Thank you.